Welcome everyone to today's PHSSR Research and Progress Series. Um, our theme today is kind of quality, cost, and the value of public health. Um, our specific um, study we're looking at today is a centralized remind and recall um, system to increase immunization rates for populations, populations of young children. This is a comparative effect of this research, research trial. Um, and our presenter today is Allison Kemp. MDMPH. Allison is the director of the Children's, Children's Outcomes Research Program at the Children's Hospital of Colorado. Um, she's a professor of pediatrics at the University of Colorado School of Medicine and also the Colorado School of Public Health. She is co-director of the Colorado Health Outcomes Program and director of an ARC-funded Center for Research and Implementation Science and Prevention, or CRISP. Um, and with that, um, Dr. Kemp, would you like to start? Hear me okay? We certainly can. Okay, great. So I'm going to be talking in a general way about increasing vaccination about young children. Um, and whoops. Sorry, I was told to advance with something and it's not working. Okay, great. So I probably don't need to sell this audience on immunizations, but basically these are the statistics about the percent decrease in disease related to the uh, various uh, immunizations we give during childhood. And immunizations are basically second only to clean water in terms of their uh, effectiveness and cost effectiveness. Here's a different uh, graph showing the same thing basically, and we see the nice little bump that we're getting recently in pertussis, and um, if this uh, line for measles were extended, we would now be seeing a bump in measles, unfortunately. So how are we doing? Back in uh, 2011, we were at 68.5 percent of uh, 19 to 35 month old fully immunized, with the healthy people 2020 goal being 80 percent. So what are the problems? And I've spent a lot of my career looking at a lot of these problems, I'm not going to talk about all of them today, but there are a variety of barriers, uh, financial ones which should be improving now related to the Affordable Care, Act, uh, Affordable Care Act, access to care issues, lack of awareness, which we are going to be re uh, dealing with today, infrastructure, regulatory issues, the complexity and expansion of the vaccine schedule, um, which again uh, we are going to be talking about today. Um, and it's important to note the incredible uh, increase in the number of vaccines uh, in the last 25 years. And then there's vaccine hesitancy related to either misinformation or safety concerns, and that's certainly uh, becoming um, more of a factor, although total vaccine refusal re remains low. So I'm going to be talking about a trial we did that compared two pragmatic approaches to trying to increase immunization rates for young children in total populations. And um, as probably many of you know, reminder recall, which is uh, the use of postcards, letters, or telephone calls to inform patients they're due or overdue for immunizations, is one of the most evidence-based methods um, for rapid increases in immunization rates. The Task Force on Community Preventive Services recommends this. Um, as one of its strongest, um, most evidence-based methods. And with new technology, this can be automated using immunization information systems or information, uh, immunization registries, and all states now have immunization registries. Reminder recall has been shown in a lot of trials to be effective in increasing rates, but only 16% of physicians nationally are doing this at the practice level. So we um, reasoned a number of years ago that maybe population-based reminder recall, if it was conducted centrally by public health departments, could offer advantages over this practice-based method. Number one, reducing burden of uh, conducting reminder recall by the practices and also the potential of reaching children who did not have a usual source of primary care. So our objectives in this trial were to compare effectiveness and cost effectiveness of two methodologies that, that uh, are sort of population-based 
um, population focused. Uh, one is the population-based method in which uh, we would conduct reminder recall centrally using the state uh, health department, um, the CIIS immunization information system or state registry, in which we would try to uh, both train and incentivize practices to do to conduct reminder recall at the practice level. So we basically uh, had, we took 14 Colorado counties, we stratified by urban and rural, and then randomized within these strata. Actually, I'm, it, the randomization was more complex, and I'll go into that in a minute, but basically within those strata, we randomized to practice-based or population-based approach at the county level. Um, I'm not going to go into the randomization in great depth unless you'd like to discuss it later, but basically we did use something called covariate constrained randomization, and this has been a very helpful technique for pragmatic trials uh, in which you need to do a cluster randomized trial but need to have, need to assure that there's very good balance on a number of factors. So this is something um, we did and we looked at, we balanced basically things like um, the percentage of pediatric versus family medicine practices, the socioeconomic uh, level of the county, um, their baseline immunization rate. We, we balanced on about 10 different parameters. So that was very helpful in making sure we had balance. So just uh, to clarify, the study population for both intervention arms was obtained from the state immunization registry, the CIIS. And in our state, patient names, addresses, and, and immunization data are automatically uploaded from birth statistics into CIIS. And then, of course, children immunization received are um, uploaded into the registry from the practice sites. Now, registry participation in Colorado is not mandated, but approximately 90% of providers to children do use the registry in Colorado. So then we downloaded names and addresses of children 19 to 35 months that appeared to need one or more immunization with all 14 counties. Now there's some obvious limitations to denominating the populations in this way. Uh, one is that kids obviously move in and out of the counties um, and they may still be in the registry um, with and associated with a particular county when they're no longer there. But, be, but because we did it the same way for both types of intervention arms, we felt that this was the most, the fairest way to, to, um, to denominate all populations. So just going over the intervention strategies, in the population-based counties, um, the reminder recall was conducted centrally by the State Health Department, and this was um, the study I'm talking about was June through September of 2010. Up to three mailings were sent to children 19 to 35 months who needed immunizations, and the uh, notices suggested parents go to their primary care provider for immunization or if they didn't have one to the public health uh, to a public health immunization site, and these were worked out with the county public health departments uh, within each county. In the practice-based recall counties, all practices were invited to attend a web-based reminder recall training uh, prior to the recall, and we actually tried to contact each practice up to eight times. Um, we suggested at these trainings that they use the same methodology, i.e. three mailings, from June to September of 2010, and we offered to pay for the mailings uh, for all practices who did remind a recall in this time frame to that age children. So we felt this was about the most um, a uh, public health department could do to try to incentivize practices. So in terms of the statistical analysis, we did have to account for the clustered nature of the data. So we used a mixed effects model. Two models were conducted to assess the association between the intervention group and whether or not a child became up to date or received any shots. So those were our two major outcomes. And we had a fixed we had used fixed effects for both models, including county baseline up-to-date rate, rural urban status of county, 
and whether or not the, last, the site of last service did remind or recall. Um, and the random effect in both models was the site of last service. We also did a cost assessment. Um, in the population-based reminder recall counties, we could, we could pretty accurately estimate staff time for training and implementation, uh, staff time for updating bad mailing addresses and mail and printing costs for up to three mailings. In the practice-based reminder recall counties, uh, although we recommended the method for doing reminder recall, they actually could, you know, they obviously could make their own choices. This is a pragmatic trial, so that's one of the things we can't control. But we did contact them when they pulled a list, which we could tell when they pulled the list. We interviewed them then about the staff time um, they spent to do reminder recall and the mailing cost or cost of telephone calls. So um, one of the major take-home messages of this trial is the reach of each intervention. This is the practice-based reminder recall arm and the population-based reminder recall arm. In the practice phase, there were 195 practice sites. Only 10 conducted reminder recall, despite the fact that we offered to pay for it. That meant that only 5% uh, potentially could have received a reminder recall. That's assuming 100% got it. In the population-based uh, counties, um, we actually were able to uh, figure out exactly who got the reminder recall um, in terms of not having returned mail. Um, and so 85% was our estimate of reach. So that's the biggest take-home message, is that we could not incentivize practices to do this. So the percent that received any vaccine within six months of those needing it was 32% in the population base compared to 23% in the practice base with an absolute effect difference of 9%. These are similar results for the percent brought up to date, 19% versus 13%, an absolute effect difference of 6%. And I want to underline this is within six months. So these are pretty rapid changes. This is a subgroup analysis within the practice-based counties um, of the percent brought up to date. And this is looking at the issue of, is it that reminder recall, if it's based at the practice, doesn't work? And the answer is emphatically no, it does work. So here are the 10 practices that did practice-based reminder recall, and they had up-to-date rates of 24% versus the percent that did, uh, that did not do practice-based reminder recall who had a rate of 12%. And if you compare the practice-based um, reminder recall to the population-based one, actually it looks as if the, the, you know, the practices that did reminder recall were more effective than the population-based method. Now it's important to remember this is 10 practices, they were not randomized, and they were likely to be quite atypical and to potentially have atypical patients. But in any case, um, it was not less effective if they did reminder recall. Um, here's the multivariable model uh, showing that they had adjusted odds ratios of close to 1.25. And the costs were part, uh, one of the biggest take home messages where the costs were very different. For the population-based reminder recall, this is the total cost, uh, excuse me, uh, cost per practice, $215 compared to $1,300 for the practice base. The cost per child receiving one or more vaccine, $10 in the population base versus $38 in the practice base. And ch per child brought up to date, $17 versus $62. Now there's some important limitations. Um, as I said, the populations were impossibly, impossible to completely accurately denominate, but we, we, we believe that the, uh, since the same methods of approximation were used in both intervention arms, this is probably not a threat to validity. Uh, the population-based reminder recall was hampered by many inaccurate, inaccurate addresses from vital statistics, so it could have been a whole lot cheaper if we didn't have to spend so much time uh, tracking down bad mailing addresses. Um, practices may have, in fact, conducted reminder recall after the six-month period of follow-up, despite 
uh, the fact they weren't going to get incentives. So if we'd held, you know, held on for longer, maybe we'd, we would we would have seen less difference. And finally, costs were based on personnel report rather than direct observation in the practice-based arm. So in this study, both practice-based and population-based reminder recall were effective. Practice-based um, may be slightly more effective um, when practices participate, but we can't really say this because those were not uh, randomly uh, distributed. Overall, at the county level, if you're approaching it at the county level and trying to increase population-based rates, the population-centralized population centralized method was um, much more effective because of lack of participation of practices, even if they were incentivized. And importantly, the cost per practice or per child vaccinated were much lower for the population-based reminder recall approach. Um, now, based on this, our implications were that centralized, the centralized approach um, was more effective and less costly. However, we, we thought based on these data and also data we got from surveys of uh, both parents and providers that the optimal approach might involve collaboration between the practices and public departments in which uh, the reminder recall notices could appear to come from both could potentially be less costly if practices were involved actively in helping to update addresses. Um, and we also felt we needed more information regarding the acceptability of, of this from both practices and the patient's perspective. So we have done some uh, further studies. Um, we, we did a, another large county-based reminder recall which showed similar results to the first, but in the second trial, um, we looked at the effect of practice endorsement. And what I mean by this is inclusion of the practice name on the reminder recall uh, notice. Um, so this was similarly a population, in, in the population, a very similar trial, but in the population-based recall counties, um, this was conducted September through November centrally, again, by the State Public Health Department. Reminder recall notices were printed with the county health department logos and the private physician's information if practices opted in for this approach, or what we called endorsed it. And then the reminder recall uh, was the same as what we've talked about previously. So here's the sub-analysis of the population-based reminder recall, the percent receiving any vaccine, if the practice's name was not included, um, the increase was about 24% versus 31% if the practice name was included uh, with an absolute effect difference of 7%. And this is similar data for percent uh, up to date. 15% if uh, practice name was not included and 25% if it was. Now, important to note also, this was not randomized. So there is uh, certainly some selection of those practices that chose to include their uh, name, probably being more effective practices in, in, in other ways, potentially, and their, their patients being slightly different um, in some ways. However, this was roughly 60% of the population that chose to endorse. So, um, you know, I think that, that there's a high likelihood this makes a big difference. Okay, so I'm going to stop there to allow for discussion and questions. Allison, thanks so much. Um, <clears throat> so we've got two folks on tap to comment today. Um, the first one is me. I'm Richard Ingram. I'm, the, I'm a professor in the University of Kentucky College of Public Health in our Department of Health Management and Policy. I've been involved in public health systems and services research and activities for a fairly long period of time, um, and currently I work with the National Coordinating Center of Pu for Public Health Services and Systems Research on their efforts to integrate um, various kind of national level data sources looking at public health system structure. Um, <clears throat> our other commentor is Lisa Van Ramdunk. Ho hopefully I pronounced that right, Lisa. Um, Ramdunk. Um, Lisa is the Executive Director of the Colorado Association of Local Public Health Officials, um, is also <clears throat> the director of the Public Health Alliance of Colorado, as well as the co-director for the Colorado Public Health Practice-Based Research Network. Um, Lisa's work is dedicated to 
encouraging system level improvements through strategic partnerships, um, workforce development, peer networking, capacity building, practice-based research and dissemination, and policy development. Prior to her career in public health, uh, Lisa worked in public relations and marketing and has experience with nonprofit and business-to-business -business communications. She has an MPH and MSW from the University of Michigan. So, Lisa, would you like to start? Sure. And can you hear me all right? Uh, yes, we can. Okay, terrific. So, um, thanks. I'm um, thrilled to be here to share um, just sort of a little bit from the local public health practice perspective. Um, we've been involved with um, Dr. Kemp on this project, um, on these few projects um, from almost the beginning, and um, so have had a, a perspective along the way. But then, so I'll zoom in a little bit into that, but then really just a couple of comments and thoughts for the group to think about um, a, a little bit bigger picture. So first I wanted to start with um, the concept of public health and primary care partnership in local communities. Um, obviously a, a topic of keen interest both in the research community and in the um, practice community and both the primary care and the public health practice communities. Um, you know, one of the things that Dr. Kemp did in, this, in these projects is um, really help build relationships within the local communities. Um, in this type of work, um, you know, she certainly could have just sort of popped in as a researcher, done some work, and walked out the door. And that, that just isn't how it operated. Um, and what that means is that um, after the research is finished, there is um, something more to work with between the public health and primary care agencies um, and organizations. Um, we know that, you know, there are many ways in which primary care is overwhelmed, and we also know that sometimes it's difficult for our local public health colleagues to articulate very well over the long term what kinds of um, ways that we can help um, primary care both meet their individual needs and in, um, in interests in helping an individual patient, but also to help them think about how they can impact their population of patient, patients and the broader population in the community. And I think this project, these projects, this concept is a good example of that. Um, despite the fact that the state health department is who did the um, actual recall, um, the local public health agencies, as you heard in the description, were connected with early on, communicated with, talk, um, they talked with Dr. Kemp and her team about um, understanding the registry situation in their community because many of our local public health agencies do try to advocate for um, their practices in their community to, to work on the registry and put all their information in the registry and sort of operate in some cases as technical assistance to that. Um, and so by, the, by um, the approach of coming to local public health early on and saying, we're going to be in your community and we'd like your help. Um, it was, I think, just really, really helpful, and that will hopefully be sustained. So um, I think the other piece I think you should just know about Colorado, if you don't already, is that we are a decentralized state, so our state health department is completely separate from our local public health agencies. We're also very strong local control, and so we don't often say, um, yes, that's something that the state health department should be doing. <laughs> um, it's almost out of principle, you know. So, so it's nice to have this kind of work to think about the second topic, which is public health system structure, to think about what are the right state and local roles, and to have some really, um, some really good research behind what the right roles might be. So it's not about politics or personality or guessing, um, having some of that where is the best place for this public health activity to occur? Um, certainly it could have been the local public health agency, but I think in this case we especially saw that at the, at the state health department level there's just the kind of um, uh, collectiveness of the work that um, can make it more uh, efficient, effective, and such. Um, so, you know, one of the remaining questions I have of how we could use this both obviously in the area of immunization, but also in other activities when we think about our public health system structure and what is the right state and local role, especially in decentralized states. You know, I, I ask you all to think about, you know, what are other um, areas of work or other public health um, primary care activities 
that we could think of similarly? Um, and you know, what what could we think about in terms of actually studying and understanding the sort of comparative effectiveness of where some of these activities could best operate? Um, and then, you know, what might not work better this way? I think one of the thinking games I have right now is thinking about communicable disease surveillance and communicable disease investigation. And there's, you know, where is that best housed within within a state? And then lastly, I think <clears throat> after the P public health primary care partnership and sort of thinking about public health system structure, the third area that, that I think about this project in practice um, is in health reform and payment systems change. And as we continue to evolve how this kind of work, both the immunizations themselves and the reminder recall and the other um, work that happens around an individual immunization, you know, as, as we continue to evolve our payment systems, how we think about where this um, kind of work may be best housed can also evolve. And I would say there's also different incentives that begin to evolve. So when we think about the ACO model, um, the Accountable Care Organization model, or in Colorado it's our RICO model, um, you know, are there incentives that we can build into those ACOs to incentivize either that local reminder recall call or state level or even at the ACO level? Um, and, and then I think that there's also tied to that is, is the funding piece. Um, you know, with our fee-for-service funding models, we've been great at thinking about funding um, the individual services, but how do we sustainably fund this kind of work that we know at the end of the day really does drive, um, drive more people to be immunized, which drives um, greater population health? How do we fund these pieces um, that support that individual immunization but are not directly that individual immunization, especially if we determine that maybe the most efficient, effective place for that work to occur is not in the um, primary care office. So just another thing to think about how we think about the sustainable kind of work. So those are the three areas that um, you know, I have thought about over time and um, would be happy to, after um, Dr. Ingram shares his thoughts, um, listen to your thoughts about the similar Lisa, thanks so much. Um, you've kind of said a lot of what I was hoping to say. So, um, you know, but you know, I, I think the exciting thing about this particular, you know, presentation today, if, if you look at the developmental arc of PHSSR, right? You know, we started out, you know, in the early 2000s with basic descriptive research, looking at how public health systems were made up, and to a little bit of an extent what they did. Uh, and you know, this was certainly useful. It, you know, it kind of gave us an, an opportunity to look at you really can get the first look at what our system looked like as a whole, right? Um, but this really didn't let us tell us anything about, about best practices. Um, you know, and beyond that, you couldn't imply causality with any findings. Uh, you know, we, we couldn't do that with this kind of research um, and because it, it really lacked the methodological rigor necessary to even draw basic, almost associations. Um, you know, now we've seen this developmental arc, you know, move in a direction characterized by more methodological complexity and using techniques such as propensity score matching and instrumental variables analysis, things like that. Um, you know, nonetheless, you know, this led us down, this, this gets us closer to being able to imply causality, right? Because at, at the end of the day, we want to know for certain whether or not what we did made a difference um, in public health. Uh, you know, but while, so some of the stuff we're doing now can help us imply causality, you know, these techniques are only as good as the data we, we have to look at, um, and there have been some concerns regarding the internal validity and reliability of analysis um, using some data sets used in PHSSR. You know, we, we use a lot of kind of national level secondary data, um, you know, and, and while that data is certainly useful, it, it's, it's, it's let us, you know, make, I think, great strides in public health. It's not necessarily the quality one might want for, for, drawing, in, for drawing kind of inferences regarding causality. Um, you know, and given to you, we've primarily limited ourselves, at least in the early days of PHSR, to looking at existing secondary data sets. Uh, that really limited us, you know, in our ability to examine the system to a large degree to looking at the governmental public health agencies. You know, I mean, they, the nature and after profiles are so useful to us in PHSSR, but they really give us an idea what the governmental public health agencies do. They don't really give us an idea what the public health system, you know, writ large, 
might be doing or not doing. Um, and that, in my mind, is why this research project is so interesting and exciting. You know, um, using these pragmatic randomized trials, such as the one discussed today, allows us to, allows us to get even closer to the gold standard of, you know, randomized double-blind control trials, which don't exist in real life, as we know. Um, so we get closer to that standard, but we also get a chance to accommodate the limited resources available to many public health practitioners and researchers. Um, you know, in the real world, we don't have the time and money necessary to conduct an, an RCT. Um, you know, these trials can be done very quickly, um, and they're relatively cheap. And they're conducted in a real-world setting, so you get a lot of bang for your buck. You get a lot of juice for the squeeze, as Glenn Mays would say. Um, you know, in this real-world setting, that they take place might be the most important part of the pragmatic trial. You know, while the main concern regarding, you know, your, your gold standard RCT is weak external validity, you know, this is much less of a concern here with this type of trial because it takes place in a practice setting, right? This is this is taking place in the real world. Um, you know, and it accounts for the context of public health practice. You know, the pragmatic trial that we're looking at today, you know, reflects what one can reasonably expect to encounter, you know, what policy and practice choices are actually available to public health practitioners on the ground, folks who are actually doing the work, you know, to make the public healthy. Um, you know, the nice thing with pragmatic trials is they also let us randomize beyond individual patients um, and kind of work at, you know, the team organizational, multi-organizational system, and even community level. So it lets us look at it gives us a lens much broader than just the lens you get by looking at individual patients. So, you know, honestly, I'd, I'd suggest that given the vast array of changes taking place in U.S. public health system and healthcare systems today, you know, ranging from healthcare reform, you know, in significant reorganizations, efforts taking place due to changes in political leadership at the state and local levels, you know, these pragmatic trials, uh, like the one discussed today, give us a great opportunity um, to develop the evidence base for public health agencies to apply, um, to assure adequate resources and the use of best practices in public health practice. These trials give us an opportunity to really, you know, right now we've got opportunities to look at um, fascinating project. I think it's a great model for us to use to kind of examine not just, you know, system delivery issues like, you know, like Dr. Kemp looked at today, but also issues that, you know, Lisa alluded to taking place kind of at, a, at an organizational level as well. So, um, yeah, so thanks so much um, again. So, Allison, do you have any response to what, what Lisa and I have, have said today? Any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, actually, um, I'd love to respond to, to a few things that were said. Number one, I, I didn't present all the preparatory work that went into uh, allowing us to do this. And I'm, I'm glad Lisa brought that up because we did a fair amount of qualitative work with uh, public health department people, with parents, with physicians, um, you know, to, to help us uh, design the messages, to help us think through any problems, and to build cohesion so that it wasn't a surprise. The other thing is that we, uh, Lisa actually was very helpful in um, introducing me to all of the county health departments. We, I went to a couple of big meetings and presented this. So I do think that that foundation work was extremely important. And it wasn't all easy. I mean, there were a couple of counties. Um, you might be able to predict them, if you know anything about politics in Colorado, that were like, no way. We don't want to be involved in this. Um, so, you know, it wasn't always easy, but I think that that work was very important, and it also built incredibly strong bridges between us and particularly the state health department. We, we have now done two additional trials. We have another one ongoing right now using these methods uh, within the RICO populations that, that Lisa brought up, within the ACOs, uh, to examine this methodology, not just for young children, but for adolescents and for adults. And we have two other grants that I hope are going to be funded um, looking at reminder recall for HPV throughout the state and for influenza. Um, so we're, we've been able to really build on these relationships, and um, it's sort of mutually beneficial at this point. Uh, the other thing I, I, I do want to comment on is the funding piece. You know, we, we've shown that this is much cheaper, but it still has a cost. And, you know, public health departments are completely strapped, and 
So are private practices. They don't even realize how much money they're spending when they try to do reminder recall on their own. So if we sort of make this a collaborative, centralized process, how do we pay for it? Um, and I think, I guess from my perspective, obviously when you've got something like an ACO, this is a cost-saving measure to immunize. I mean, there's so much data showing how much cost-saving there is associate, associated with immunization, both for children and adults. Um, so that may be one of the mechanisms. But it, it does seem as if, um, if it gets cheaper and cheaper as the data systems get more efficient and aligned, for example, as more practices are HL7 compatible and there's bi-directional information going from uh, practices to the registry and back um, so that we have to spend less and less money and time with incorrect informa contact information. This could all get so much cheaper. But it's still, I think, going to require some kind of a collaborative model where everybody kicks in a little bit. And I think that that's sort of the end game from, from where I sit. That's what I hope would happen. I do want to say one more thing, too. Um, we, Lisa brought up other methods of uh, collaboration. And this, this study, um, shortly after this study, we tried something else with, the, with several of the county health departments. We tried an experiment, another pragmatic trial, in which we, we um, randomized practices to either doing flu delivery on their own or to a collaborative method where the county health department and the practice work together to try to get you know, the, the entire uh, population of the practice immunized. And this was an example of a much tougher pragmatic trial because we encountered a whole lot of problems that we didn't expect, all, all to do with um, issues about purchasing vaccine, having you know, concerns about the practice, not being able to use up their vaccine, all kinds of problems with collaboration that were very interesting and very important. But, um, you know, we're talking about the wonderfulness of pragmatic trials. They also really are challenging sometimes because you do really come up against uh, those tough issues about, you know, you, you may think collaboration is a, a, a wonderful idea. And I actually came up with the idea for this grant. I thought it was going to be this great, you know, <laughs> wonderful collaboration, it turned out to be extremely difficult to do. So um, I, I just think we, we've had a lot of spin-offs, and it's been, I, I believe, very strongly in this uh, collaboration. We're open for questions now, but I have a question, Allison. So given, you know, given what you've just said, let's circle back there. Let's say we had some folks on the phone today who were interested in kind of applying, uh, you know, this, you know, the, the, this, this technique to another research project, what would your suggestions or kind of, you know, advice, what, what advice would you give them um, when they're just kind of starting up there or just even thinking about the research project? What, what advice would you give them to make, maybe to, to make it work smoother for them, if that makes sense? Well, I, I, I think, um, first of all, if they're using a registry, it's important to, um, using a mature registry <laughs> would be, very important. So I, I would I think the system would be very tough in a state where their registry is very new and incomplete because then you're you're using pretty bad data. So I that's number one. Figuring out how mature the registry is, how how uh, accurate the records are likely to be, and then beginning the collaboration with the health. With, usually the the IIS is based in the health department. So beginning that collaboration. You know, another way this could go, of course, is within an ACO or within a closed model HMO. I mean, that's the same idea. Um, so it's all about how accurate the data is and how much cooperation you have with that data system. So we certainly, um, I mean, all of the registries have the forecasting ability to, to generate uh, reminder recall reports or to actually even many of them to generate the postcards. So that's not, um, virtually all of them have that capability to my knowledge. Um, so this is possible to do in every state, but there are different levels of maturity and participation 
in the immunization registry. So that's, that's one important issue. Um, and forming the relationships, I think, would be the other. We would be really glad to give assistance to anybody who would like to do this, including uh, information about how we returned addresses, you, know, you have to pay a little bit of attention to that system. And we'd be glad to share all of that information with any. Great. And again, we're open for questions. So if you have questions, please just type them into um, in the chat box on your screen here. So we do have one question, uh, Allison. Um, Ann Kelly wanted to know, uh, she says, Dr. Kemp, was the second study conducted in the same or different communities in the first study? So you presented kind of two different um, studies. So the second one was the first? W was it the same communities as the first or different? Many were the same. There were a few different, but, but many were the same. And the second study that we did showed, I mean, it was the same results, but a little bit less um, effectiveness. And I think that was number one, we, we started at about 15% higher um, overall immunization rate. So we were getting um, to the point where we may have been weeding out <laughs> some of the people who weren't going to respond to a simple reminder recall, and we needed to, you know, to go to the next level, and there are certainly many levels that you need to go to if you're trying to get everybody. Um, so I presented the first one because I thought it was more typical for most states. You know, first time you're doing it and your immunization rate is, is sort of lower. Um, but yes, many of them were the same. Great. Okay. Any other questions? So I have a question. I'm looking at your slide, which is, you know, has the pie charts comparison of the reach of the intervention. And you've got, it looks like, you know, it, with your, and maybe I'm, I'm reading this, this slide wrong, but it looks like with your population-based um, approach, almost 85% of the children cover, uh, eligible um, you know, received a notice, whereas the practice-based reach, it looks like roughly maybe 5% of the children available received a notice. And it just seems to me like that's a huge, I mean, the difference there is just huge. Um, and, and that would suggest to me that the population-based approach just is a sheer numbers game, is a, is, a, is a really kind of a much more, well, it has potentially a much more effective, effective method. Would you, would you agree with that? Um, well, you know, of course, the, we don't know that 85% were reached. That's okay. our estimate based on that's we, estimate, yeah. we, we no longer got returned mail. Initially, okay. a lot of incorrect mail, and we, okay. uh, you know, did that process. So, yeah, I mean, the, the, the lesson here is not that practice-based reminder recall doesn't work. It's that if you're trying to increase rates for a population, it's not going to work as well to put your efforts on trying to get practices to do this. You know, trying to, to have every, every little private industry learn how to do this just was not effective. But, and, and maybe that seems, it, it sort of seems like a big duh to me now, but honestly, there has been so much push from the CDC and from all the preventive organizations, there has been so much focus on the practice for a lot of years. And I think there are something like 25 randomized trials at the practice level showing the effectiveness of this. So, you know, it's, it really is time to think outside of the box a little bit. Because yes, it works, but if people won't do it, it doesn't matter. Great, thank you. Um, it looks like we've got uh, oh, not another question. Uh, someone did type in a question, will there be a copy of this presentation available to download at a later time? Um, Anne, I believe there will, correct? Actually, um, the slides are available in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, where it says presentation February 4th, you can download from there. And yes, we'll have a recording of this presentation. It'll be up on our website um, within a couple.
that are there other areas that you think this approach would work um, other than immunizations? Um, some of the other patient education areas or I think there are a lot. I think there are definitely other areas where this work. I think I think collaborate collaborative um, interventions involving the community, public health, and the practice are the most effective ways, first of all, to accomplish things like preventive care, where it's often simply a question of getting people in. Um, I think places where it doesn't work is, is more complex management of patients with, you know, chronic conditions and that kind of thing. And that needs to, I think, firmly re remain within the primary care site. But there is so much of what we need to do in primary care, particularly in the preventive care realm, that is probably best accomplished outside of the practice certainly in collaboration with the practice, but if you think of the type of screening we're trying to do all the time in practice and uh, things like immunization delivery or, you know, colon cancer screening, um, blood pressure checks, all kinds of preventive care, um, a collaboration with public health would be so much more effective and efficient. So I think, I think yeah, particularly in the area of preventive care. Thank you. Um, looks like there are no more questions. Um, so I'd like to thank you again, Allison and Lisa, for, for your participation in the webinar. Great. We appreciate you, you being, being willing to present and comment. Um, our upcoming PHSR Research and Progress webinars in February. Um, we've got one next week, Cross-Jurisdictional Shared Service Arrangements in Local Public Health, Research and Progress by Susan Zahner and Kusuma Matamala. And then on Thursday the 19th, we've got Identifying and Learning from Positive Deviant Local Public Health Departments in Maternal and Child Health by Tamar Kleiman um, from the University of Sciences in Philadelphia. And then we've got like a few in March as well. Um, and a few in April. And then don't forget, um, Tuesday and Wednesday, April 21st and 22nd, will be the 2015 PHSSR Keeneland Conference in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, I believe registration is still available. For more information, please contact Ann Kelly, the project manager. Here's her information on the screen. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Ingram? Yes. Um, I'd be very glad for anyone to contact me. Can you send out my email? We'll do. We'll do that. We'll do that. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for having me.